It is July the 14th, 2022. I'm Chris and this is Curiously Polar. Look who's back. Just say something for the people. Hello. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> Henry, the lost son, is back. I'm very happy to to be talking to you right now. Um, you've been. I'm happy as well. <laughs> yeah, you've been somewhere. Where yeah, I've been, been gone uh, a, bit. a while. Um, I got the opportunity to um, work as expedition leader on uh, Le Commandant Charcot, which is a French flagged icebreaker, mm. uh, first hybrid LNG uh, marine diesel fuel icebreaker and that's a terrific ship beautiful platform to work at and when i got the inquiry um to start the arctic season which is this first arctic season with uh guests that was uh, so it's a new it's a fair it's a pretty new ship yeah got put into service last september september 21 okay. and it reached the, the north pole as an ice trial and was highly celebrated because it was the first French flagship that ever reached the North Pole. So uh, it was, uh, of course, um, with a French uh, pride. The French or, pride, yes. Exactly. Oui, oui. <laughs> <laughs> but that was a was a big thing with the two most experienced um, captains for the polar regions at the helm, um, Captain Garcia and Captain Marchessault. And uh, that was highly celebrated. And yeah, I got asked after the Antarctic season to join to uh, start the Arctic season in East Greenland. And um, I couldn't say no. That was just really something. If, you, if you're a, a polar nerd as I am, an, an ice nerd as I am, then there is no other opportunity that, that that's similar to that. So it's, 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 really, one, it's one of the things that's very hard to say no to. Yeah, it, it's yeah. unrivaled and um, was easy for me to say, okay, I would love to give it a try. And... Then I got the information, yeah, season starts end of April. I was like, end of April, East Greenland. Has everyone ever been there before by ship? And obviously not, so, <laughs> because you have plenty of sea eyes. <laughs> mm. um, oh, but this is an icebreaker. So it, absolutely, uh, absolutely. So that's where, where the ship uh, really plays out its um, advantages. It's a new experience. Wow. But still, no one has been there um, at that part of the season, so... We talked a lot to, to locals in uh, Trasilak and uh, Itokotomit, and both were very, very skeptical. So both uh, locations were just like, okay, there's no chance you can reach that, uh, that destination. And it took us actually uh, quite some time and some efforts. Um, was it more even like it's nice... going down a path and then backtracing and trying a different one, that kind of stuff? Yes, yes. Okay. So working on an icebreaker uh, for me, just unveiled it's a it's a very different work than um expedition ships expedition cruise ships you, you i'm not a little I'm, I'm a little bit unfair now but it's it's a little bit like bus driving you have a schedule uh, you have a landing <laughs> sites and if the weather is not cooperative then you choose different landing sites but you know where yeah. you're going to and even if you're not um know the particular landing site you know the area with the icebreaker there are no landing sites you are in the ice in sea ice and <laughs> the ice the conditions <laughs> exactly and the and the sea ice conditions uh, in east greenland were very very challenging this uh, arctic season or still are um we have a lot of pole ice which came down there so we were expecting um the regular sea ice in east greenland but what came down was multi-year polar ice and i i thought i knew about sea ice and i stood on that bridge of uh Charcot and we we went very slowly through ice and when you break it it just flips over and you see the thickness you get an idea of the thickness and what the ice looks like and we had um not exaggerating here six meter thick <gasps> ice and it was crystal blue i've never seen so blue sea ice before so, so you have so one, the, the, like like the size of some icebergs, but not icebergs, but sea ice. Ab absolutely, and you have wow. like a, a classical um, distinguishing uh, on on uh, expedition ships is you distinguish white ice from blue ice because blue ice is considered glacial ice, and you don't want to touch that. White ice, if you can push it and you touch the the hull, it's no problem. White so, ice has more more air included, right? Exactly, it's less dense. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you just 
go through that sea ice and the surface is white but then you see literally four five six meters of blue crystal blue ice you just think oh my god it looks like glacial ice <laughs> we're sure there's no glaciers <laughs> somewhere close by and it, it took us a while to to really go through that um cutting through that or like ramming through it takes a lot of effort and we have to for for that particular ship, rethink the way we are actually selling trips, uh, advertising trips, but also uh, we have to rethink how we operate the trips with guests on board because guests obviously buy a trip with a certain destination in mind. You know, we have, for example, itineraries like in the beginning of the season, the first trip had both places Tassilak and Idukotomit um, in uh, in the itinerary, and people have, who are booked on charcoal they are usually um, very avid travelers. So they have been in the area before. So they want to just see those places in a different time of a year. So they and have an expectation us, that you that you might not be able to fulfill. No, they actually have the expectation to see those places. That's what I mean. But you but you as the as the provider uh, might not be able to get there because of but the that ice was conditions. Something that yeah, that, that really just struck us as a lightning um, because of the conditions. It took us so much yeah. longer to reach certain destinations that we needed to stay in a in a in a very close area. Um, we had uh, <laughs> um, a place, a cape close to uh, Scoresby Sound, through the opening of Scoresby Sound, um, mm -hmm. north of it, at Liverpool Land, um, which we just renamed into um, the Inaccessible Cape because we. <laughs> We just had a look um, at the satellite pictures, and um, we, we use uh, drift uh, ICC from Drift Noise. Uh, drift Noise is a uh, a spin-off from Alfred Wegener Institute that provides a software where you can um, get access to a drift forecast for ice, but you also get concentration, a sea ice concentration, and you get satellite pictures laid over. The map, so you get really um, up to date pictures and uh, ideas of how the sea ice develops. And we were looking at all those information, and we just saw a humongously large fast ice area on the coast. And the place where it was the the smallest was on that cape, and that, there was a fast ice of roughly a mile, and then there was another mile of um, of this polar ice coming down. And the polar ice was so dense and so rugged, you had a lot of um, hummocks and pressure ridges, which makes it impossible to do some activities on the ice because you you have no visibility for uh, polar bears and those pressure it's ridges. It's dangerous. It's very dangerous. It's very dangerous, yeah. 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 It's dangerous for a number of times. So first of all, those pressure ridges and hummocks um, might have just holes um, going into the water because that's actually where seals are hiding. But because seals are hiding, that's also a playground for polar bears because that's where they get their food. And if you're down on the ground and we had the situation where we just decided, okay, we, we're not going any further because going through those um, ice conditions, that took us roughly six hours to go a mile, just one mile, six hours. And it was, what was it, uh, 17 rammings. So uh, you just wow. go in with a ship. And then you reach a point where um, where it's impossible, so you back up, and then you just um, take another run, and you just go into the same area. And we did that 17 times, and we just made one mile in those six hours, and then we just decided you have to stop. It's just not worth the effort because your your consumption just goes up. How uh, dangerous the, is it to get iced in? Because you have ice behind you closing. No. I guess that, that's not a problem. It. It's not really a problem because that particular icebreaker has much higher capabilities um, astern. So the oh, I see. Okay, the Commandant Chaco has two azipots, um, and each azipot has a six diameter uh, propeller with seventeen megawatt of of power. <laughs> seventeen okay. megawatt each. Okay. So I we think had in, some... I think in kilowatts. Yeah, okay. <laughs> So we we had some some uh, situations where we uh, decided to reverse and and go astern because then the propellers are not propulsion in in the terms of pushing but they're actually crushes they're just like like a blender you have in the kitchen when you crush ice 
So you use them to just go there and just um, crush the ice and push it outside. So you just anyone, back up there. Anyone need crushed ice? Let's just reverse for a minute. <laughs> Absolutely. And the, the idea is there that the... So you can break ice going um, going forward just by going onto the ice and then the sheer weight of the ship just uh, breaks the ice. But if that doesn't work anymore because the ice is too, too dense or too thick... Then you go a stern, and a stern that in theory or technically, um, you can cut through fifteen meter thick pressure ridges. Wow. So th this gives you an idea how powerful the ship and and those azipods are. And when you just get stuck in a um, in a situation where ice is just closing in, we had that actually on on one landing site where we were out with guests for a couple of hours, and then um, the, the current just pushed the ice in. Then you just obviously go astern and cut through, and uh, it takes a while. It's not the most comfortable uh, way of traveling, but you get through. So the ship, because of its nature of being an icebreaker, needs to have um, a safe return to port um, mm -hmm. function, and that means it needs to have double redundancy systems. So the systems are not only once or twice on board, but uh, three, four times. Um, that also means that it needs to be capable to um, rescue itself to to a very high degree. And that someone, makes it... Someone once told me when you buy a big, um, a big a Jeep or something, that's the kind of vehicle that will break down in a location where the tow truck doesn't get to. And that is pretty much the same situation. There is no tow truck exactly. for a no. icebreaker. Yes. And when you consider going to the North Pole, there there is no search and rescue capability. So you have to have um, that capability uh, on board. And I remember we had an episode, I think two years ago, when, when the project came up the first time in 2019, I think, um, that the two of us, we talked about that here on the show, about the, the, the difficulties or the danger of not being able to manage an emergency yourself. Mm -hmm. And now being able to uh, have have worked on that ship is just really uh, an eye opener of um, how diligent you have to prepare trips, how mm. how 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 intense you really have to think what could go wrong. And there are so many uh, variables here which have been considered. Um, the the rescue kits, the rescue procedures, all of that has been custom written for that ship for the purpose of that ship for the areas going um going to but then also the ship gives you the possibility to go to places where no other ship can go at that time of the year mm. so for us this cape um of in <laughs> accessibility <laughs> we tried on three trips so we tried it three times and we didn't make it on one of them and that's one of those points when you have to just be very honest to the guests and just say, um, technically, we can manage to go there. It will take two more days. So the question is, is it worth it? Does it make much sense to burn like triple four, uh, quadruple amounts of fuel just to go to that spot to have that landing? Does it make sense to stay three days at one spot to make that one particular landing or do we decide to leave that place and do some activities in the ice so you'll have to be prepared to have some discussions with the guests and in involve them in the planning process in some way and you also have to be prepared to i would say entertain them while you are at sea for longer right yes so the onboard uh, programming the onboard program is really a completely different um topic compared and, to and you have a ships. lot of things up your sleeve i mean this is how i yes. how i have, how i know you with like you, there's so many different topics that you have uh, lectures prepared about and you can it, there's almost nothing out there that you cannot discuss that you do not have some toe in the water of so, and the other thing is also, you know, when you learn on uh, regular expedition cruise ships, you you have kind of a of a schedule, right? You do a morning operation, you do an afternoon operation. If you have a sea day or half a sea day, you do your lectures, you do bar talks or recaps or whatever you want to call that. Yeah, you, know, you have a um, kind of a, do a, a standard photography program. session, photography or session, workshop, very exactly. important. But then on Chaco, on the icebreaker. Things are changing by the minute. So how big is for it? Me, Just a quick question in the middle. Um, how many people, how many guests are on board? 
So it is capable of getting 250 guests. Um, oh, that's sizable, we, yeah. In, in the polar regions, we aim for um, 200. So to, to stay in that um, category one chip, which means that you are able to to book in, uh, in Antarctica most of the landing sites. Mm -hmm. With category two, you have limitations. And category two also means you have to have different um, embarkation, disembarkation procedures. That just takes much longer time, and that's something to, to consider, uh, obviously, yeah. as well. Um, it has, I think, 150 crew at the same time. And we were operating with an expedition team between 16 and 23. So that was the mm -hmm. the range we, we covered there. Okay. So if you have a die in, in, the, in, in the ice, or just let's say things are not going according to plan and you suddenly have three, four dice in the ice, then you have to keep the expedition team busy. You have to keep the guests busy because as exciting it is to go to the ice, it gets very quickly boring unless you really an ice nerd. And mm -hmm. I stand on the bridge um, after one and a half months and still can't get enough of just seeing those ice yeah, flows just nice rolling nerd. over. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. That's what I say. Um, but if you're not, if you're just um, just in, uh, in um, brackets, uh, a, a tourist who wants to see places, then it gets very quickly uh, monotonous when you go through the ice. And it can become uncomfortable if you have to do the ramming because then you have quite some vibrations going through the ship. It's not the noise. The ship is incredibly quiet, but it's the vibrations that really um, can can become or come to a, hybrid, to a grade where it's... Hybrid getting, ship means it does generate electricity and then has an electric um, motors, right? Yeah, so the other Azipods have um, each Azipod has two electrical engines. Mm -hmm. So we we um, have the engines all outside the ship. The Azipods are hanging uh, below the um, the stern. Oh, it's, it's like is it like is it like uh, the 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 jet turbines hanging outside of a wing in an airplane, pretty much? Yes, yes, exactly. So that also gives us the possibility that each Azipod can uh, just rotate three hundred and sixty degrees. So you're very, very uh, maneuverable. It's a very oh, great, wow, okay. very great uh, thing. But it also gives you a lot of space um, on board. So we have uh, six generators, if I remember correctly, and those generators have two fuel sources. Um, one is marine diesel oil and the other one is uh, LNG, liquid nat uh, natural gas. Um, we have battery packs on board, which give us the, the possibility, the, the theoretical possibility to run the ship on batteries for about 30 minutes. But the idea of the batteries is not so much to uh, run the ship autonomous for 30 minutes, but to give us less likelihood of blackouts. So if something uh, like a like a power spike happens uh, on board of a ship because you can't do an operation. So everyone just goes to a cabin and switches on the, uh, the television, but at the same time, the, the, the water kettle and plugs in the camera and whatnot, then you have a power spike. Those, and those batteries that, are buffers pretty much. They smooth exactly. out the load on the ship, yeah. Yes, and on, on some ships, on particularly on the older ships, that leads very quickly to um, to a blackout because then the system has an overload and can't cope uh, with such a high request in a short amount of time. So the batteries. See, I've, here... I've only been on very small ships compared to that, so there was, <laughs> there was never a problem. The electricity was never a problem in those, but I can imagine two hundred people um, starting their hair dry at the same time. That will change yeah. a few things. We we had a, uh, a so I had a couple of of blackouts in uh, in my career already. Yeah, and when you are sailing in ice or around icebergs, it's right. getting tense very, very quickly when you have a, a blackout on a ship. Um, but yeah, here we have the batteries um, as a kind of a buffer system in between, and that works very, very well. So I'm, I'm really, really happy um, about that. But in general, just um, being able to operate in those areas means also it gives you the luxury of just putting the ship into the ice overnight. And when the ship is completely quiet in the ice overnight, then the wildlife is coming. And then you have polar bears uh, in the middle of the night just approaching the, the vessel and just really taking their time. And you are not following the bears, which you should not do in the first place, but you actually, you're just sitting duck 
waiting for them to get curious enough. And they right. are incredibly curious. We had, I think, the best polar bear encounters I've ever had um, in, in, in my career, it, just in those one and a half months. Um, incredibly intense, uh, incredibly close, really, really great. We had some discussions with AICO, the Association of um, Arctic Expedition Cruise Operators, um, which uh, asked us not to publish certain pictures because it shows a bear ship interaction which implies that the ship got too close to the wildlife, oh. which is not which is not um so we we're not it's supposed, not supposed to, do that. to happen yeah exactly um and it took us a while to explain to to Aniko that we were literally uh, docked into an ice flow so we went into and when we talk about ice flow people usually have like a 5 meter um idea of an ice flow but that ice flow was kilometers wide in diameter i think it was um six miles nautical miles times uh, five nautical miles so it was a humongous piece of ice and we just sat the ship in uh, into into the ice uh, into that ice flow and we're drifting with that at about uh, five miles for, for about um 12 hours so the speed was also uh, quite something that surprised us but when you sit in that ice flow then polar bears are just passing by, by because they are the nomads of the Arctic. They're just um, on foot all the time. They're just walking, walking, walking. They're could roaming you, could around. Could you bring us some video? Should we play this while you talk? Yes, yes, please. Well, who, who, who made this video? So on board we have um, a dedicated photo and video team. Um, oh. The photographer was um, Morgan Monaret and the videographer was uh, Camille Martin. So this is where you uh, all have to switch to the video version of this. Yeah, please come to YouTube and have a look at that because that is really outstanding footage. Um, Camille has an amazing eye and uh, did a terrific job here too. This is amazing uh, material, yeah. To to really grasp the moment. I have no idea how she manages it, but she's always at the right place in the right time. That's what we photographers do. That's our job. Absolutely, yeah. But that's for for me. I'm um, um, I'm I'm up and about um, as early as possible and as late as possible. So for me, it's really uh, I'm always there or try to be always there. And I still have the feeling when I watch that movie, I missed like a couple of uh, occasions. But then you see um, in those pressure ridges, just bears roaming around, and there are like yeah. really moments when when you can't really decide: do you want to go left or right? Because you have like three, four bears around. Um, we have here the opening of Scorosby Sound um, frozen all in, um, then just ice assessment, just going with the team first on the ice when the ship um, has stopped and just assessing how safe is the ice, how thick is it, does it make sense to get the guests out, is it safe enough or not. Um, polar bear guards on board of the ship and on the ice. There's a lot of things to consider before guests are going out. Um, we have a helicopter on board, which is not for um, guest tours, but for for the sole purpose of um, search and rescue. So for our own rescue capabilities, but also for reconnaissance. So we are going out on average, I would say, once a day when we're in the ice to get a, a better picture from the air, how the situation looks like. You can see here the ship sitting in the ice. Um, and... Also for navigational purposes. And when we are navigating in the ice, uh, you're in the helicopter, you just say, yeah, well, that's a very easy navigation. You just follow the lead between mm -hmm. the ice floors there. And then you're back up on a bridge and you don't see the, the leads anymore. So that's when the helicopter comes in very handy and just really um, pilots the ice, uh, the, the ship through the ice. Yeah, and then you have those very, very close uh, encounters of bears who get very curious and take the time when the ship is completely quiet sitting in there um, to get as close as possible. And they are really curious animals. Uh, that's just, uh, it's incredible. I can see that. That was really, that is really something. Wow. That's a really intense uh, ship. Uh, I've never been so tired on a ship before and I've done uh, a couple because of... It's so much to do. Yeah, it's just re so many changes. Um, you can't really you don't want to leave the bridge because a it's very stunning it's really great um landscape to see but at the same time there's so many changes happening all the time anytime um 
you have the guest interaction, you have the team interaction, you have to coordinate uh, the entire team, but you have to have uh, an eye on the constant changes that are happening by the minute. And I've never had that on any other ship so intense like I had it on Jacques Co. So for me, that was a very tiring experience, but at the same time, a very rewarding experience. I've never had such close uh, wildlife encounters. I've never had so much ice. It's just amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I envy you just a little bit, just a tiny little <laughs> bit. I wish I could have, I could have uh, been a stowaway and have my cameras with me and things. Wow! Oh, I wish I could have you on board. That was just uh, <sighs> was was outstanding, really. No, congratulations. That sounds like a trip of a lifetime, sort of. It it is. Um, East Greenland has surprised me a, a lot. Um, yeah, it just presented itself completely different from from what I know. So going to places was just literally going there for the first time, even though it wasn't the first time. Um, was a big learning for everyone on board. Um, also in terms of ice conditions, of learning um, about ice, how ice works, how ice um, behaves, how we behave around wildlife, how we uh, affect and impact wildlife. Um, a lot of things that were really there. And so. And I, I've, I mean, the the closest I have, which is not even that close, um, of an experience to be somewhere at a different time of the year that I'm usually there, was when the two of us were up in Norway in winter, in February, and that was uh, on a ship. That was kind of mind blowing because I knew that area quite well, but from summer and being yeah. there in winter with very different weather, where very different experiences. Um, unexpected experiences because the because the team on board was wonderful, so they gave us opportunities that were not even in the plan, like uh, going to Scrova Lighthouse and these kind of things, oh, yes. which oh, that was an amazing just trip. just just so amazing to be able to do this yeah. on a spon on a whim because well we're there and one of the guys on board has contacts there and he knows people and uh, gets the key and <laughs> used and used to be the lighthouse keeper himself for a few years so it's yeah. like it's like okay i'll i'll take that that's experiences that you don't get anywhere else so yeah. um but but being there at a but different those time kind of, of things year, make the trip yeah and the being there at a different time of year but which is by the way when i do photo tours which i'm planning on ramping up again um that's kind of the thing that in the even with past photo tours I have um, always the best memories, and people who were on those tours always have the best memories of these unexpected things, of yeah. things that that were not in the plan, but that turned out to be just so much better than uh, all the the stops by the book, so to speak. And um, so, yeah, I'm I'm, I'm working on doing some things. Um, that are, let's say, environmentally friendly uh, around Europe that uh, we, you can do with an EV, that you can do with as minimum impact as possible. That's kind of the idea that I have right now. It's not, uh, it's, not too much ice there. Up on that. <laughs> no, 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 but uh, um, it's fascinating landscape and fascinating culture and, and people, um, wildlife. There's so many things coming together. So I'm, I'm, I'm not there just for the ice, but... Um, yeah, what we discussed um, before the show, there are so many um, factors that come in. And for me right now, I think as much as I love the ice, it does not need to be necessarily always ice. Right? We should we should start thinking about, I've, I've, for the longest time, I've had this inkling that I wanted to go somewhere east, like Eastern Europe, and that would be a good fit. I know someone I who lives there, and <laughs> I kindly invite you to Transylvania. It's a beautiful space in the east. How, how about a road trip from Germany through Czechia, through Hungary, Vienna, to Slovenia. Romania, to Transylvania, and yeah, uh, beautiful spots along the road. Go visit. And, I mean, the Count destination Dracula is amazing as well. <laughs> now, so so it's just it's just wild brain farts at this point, but um, yeah. Maybe, maybe, maybe I'll find a couple of people who want to do that road trip with me, and I'm, I'm sure there are a couple of crazy people around to to join you in it. And um, you yeah, don't even just, have to be that crazy, to be honest. No, no, you just have to be um, two weeks open, of time. I think. Two weeks of time, and and that's anyway. also what what I learned on that ship is so the ship is mainly um, attracting avid travelers who've been with the company on 
multiple trips already. And when I say multiple, I don't mean like uh, two, three, four trips, but we have people who have been with that company for 38, 40 trips. So that's a, a lot of of experience. So they, they know also the area already. They know the landscape, but they come there because they want to see East Greenland at a different time of the year in a completely different code. Yes. And luckily, the vast majority of people is very open to the changes that are happening um, to the itinerary. Um, they are very happy to the changes of um, activities. And as you said, the the most memorable experiences are those you don't plan, which are just happening. And in the Arctic, it's very, very different from Antarctica. In Antarctica, it's almost like a safari. You know where mm -hmm. the penguin rookeries are. You know where the whales are feeding. In the Arctic, it's so much more difficult to spot wildlife, to actually explore wildlife. Of course, you also have some regularities, like you you know where where it's more likely to see, to see certain whales, um, and you have an idea where polar bears are around. And we knew we would see some polar bears along the ice edge in East Greenland. The amount we've seen there, because of the capabilities of the ship, has just blown everyone's mind. And that's just really something uh, we started a new citizen science project uh, on board, which is a polar bear log where we just um, started to take down uh, coordinates, uh, the shape of the bear, the conditions the bear's in, um, the presumed uh, gender, the um, behavior, how did the, the bear behave, how did it interact with the ship, what did we do, how long did we stay with the bear, and so on and so forth. And uh, we are currently talking to a couple of um, research institutes to, to see how that can be uh, of use for them, because... Just from the very first trip, the amount of polar bears we saw was just mind-blowing, literally. It was just something totally unexpected. We thought about possibly a bear or two per trip, but when you're on a 10-day trip and you suddenly have like 22 bears around, that's just really something you can't grasp. It really is hard to say goodbye to that place and go back to Reykjavik to get a new group of guests. It's just really a goosebump moment after another. Okay, that okay. Uh, we'll have to stop this here, otherwise I'll. Oh man! So yeah, you had quite an experience. Um, and I'm going we'll... back in in August, end of August. Mm -hmm. I'm uh, I'm taking the uh, ship to the last trip to the North Pole. So we're gonna reach the geographical North Pole, and after that, going from Reykjavik um, through South. Greenland into the Northwest Passage and in the Northwest Passage all the way to Nome we aim for the the very rarely used northern route north of uh, Banks Island in the um, McClure Strait and McClintock Channel and um, with that same ship. Sound with that very same ship um, because that's where the ice conditions are requiring uh, a proper ice there is a reason there. that route is a less the lesser used one. Yes, absolutely, right. and I'm I'm just really looking forward for that. Um, Northwest Passage is just really something very very close to my heart. It's a very amazing um, place, so diverse in so many ways, and you, it, it doesn't matter how many times you travel the Northwest Passage, there are always new things to explore and to see, and just being able to now go to a place where none of us has been before in that very. Northwest Passage is just something uh, absolutely amazing. I'm just really looking forward for that. All right. I guess that brings us to the end of the episode. Thank you, Henry, for, for giving us a report. This is, um, yeah, this is okay. So nice to be back. <clears throat> I'm quite, quite envious about these things. I w yeah, well... But I'm pretty sure we'll do some more travel together in Absolutely. one way or the other. That is at least the plan. So thanks, everyone. We are online at curiouslypolo.com. We'll be back soon. Until then, everyone, 